Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 9, Episode 55. That's Dave Bryan. I am Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Dave, happy Friday to you, and literally, I guess, how about them Cowboys? Yeah, how about them Cowboys? Uh, uh, interesting game. That well, I don't know how much you got to watch of it last night. I, I uh, picked it up about... Uh, I got a late start, about a minute, uh, missed the first minute of it there. But uh, uh, high-flying Saints offense... Uh, really grounded. Now, a lot of it had to do with uh, some miscues, obviously, on offense. Uh, Drew Brees, <laughs> if you would have bet me that Drew Brees would have played the whole game and only threw for 127 yards with one touchdown and one interception, I would have gladly tried to take your money. Uh, and that's what he finished with. He he wasn't sharp at all. It looked like they were definitely victims of a, of a short week. I think there were a few drops involved in there. Uh, so, a miss. A missed at least one missed fourth down. I think maybe, maybe another missed fourth down in the game. Uh, the, the Saints only had 14 first downs in total. They were three of 11 on third downs in the game. Total net yards 176. Uh, they only averaged 3.6 yards per play. Not that the not that the Cowboys' offense was all that great, especially in the second half. I mean, you let you let. You let New Orleans hang around like I mean I think you probably thought as well too. Uh, they they messed up there at the end, given uh, given the uh, Saints to back the foot football with you know, I think a little bit over two minutes left. But that's when Breeze threw his interception and the ball game was over at that point. I think I think we learned a couple of things Thursday night, and that's. Uh, Defense, some good defense can still be played in the NFL, and bad officiating still exists. And we learned that that Week 16 game against the Saints probably going to mean a good deal for both teams. I know you <laughs> speculated beforehand that maybe it wouldn't. New Orleans might lock this thing up, but does not appear to be the case anymore. Yeah, I jinxed that yesterday. I wrote, <laughs> I wrote, I wrote about that uh, yesterday afternoon. How if the, uh, you know, if the Saints were to beat the Cowboys and then win their next two, and then of course you had the Rams and the the Bears playing in Week I think fourteen, and you know the the Rams playing the Lions this week, and the Bears a tough game I think this week as well too. You know, so it was definitely you could it wasn't unthinkable. Let's just put it that way uh, that uh, the Week sixteen game against the Steelers talking about the Saints uh, could wind up being meaningless but now they've lost to the Cowboys I mean I think you can throw all that out the window now so uh, uh, that week 16 game for both teams both the Saints and the Steelers there should still be very much a lot on the line uh, for for both those teams so it was just a theory and the Saints went and screwed that up uh, uh, last <laughs> night and you know look say what you will about the Cowboys I mean that you know a tough start this year that defense of theirs is really playing well you know uh, Vander Ash and 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 uh, Smith uh, those two linebackers can cover a lot of ground uh, of course you know Chido, Ch- uh, how do you say his first name Chidobe, uh, Awuze. yeah Awu- Awuze, a guy that you know we we uh, we scouted quite a bit when when he came out and uh, of course uh, 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 who's the safety over there they they converted uh, to a cornerback Byron Jones yeah Jones is another one former uh, former I think first or first or second round draft pick that uh, uh, really has panned out nicely for them so you know if you're able to get after the quarterback and coverage and, and rush goes hand in hand you know we saw that firsthand from the Cowboys so uh, the, the Saints aren't Aren't, uh, you know, they, they can be beat. Let's put it to you that way. Yeah, they certainly can be beat. As I'm going to hop on my train here and, and ride away from you, Dave. Um, but, yeah, later in the show, just as a heads up for Steelers Nation, uh, we have a great interview. Uh, we recorded it Wednesday evening, I believe, just for a whole scheduling kind of issue. But we're talking to Eric Williams from ESPN, um, beat writer covering the Chargers. Fantastic interview. Uh, be sure to follow him at Eric underscore D underscore Williams. Um, so we'll have that interview later in the show. So, Dave, let's move into, I guess, kind of talk about the Steelers here and, and give us a preview of this injury report. Yeah, and, and the the Thursday injury report 
We had uh, Marcus Gilbert not working, so it doesn't look like he's going to be back this week. It looks like he's headed for a sixth consecutive missed game uh, with that knee injury. Morgan Burnett, a guy that Mike Tomlin didn't even mention during his rundown uh, Tuesday of the injuries, did not practice for a second consecutive day. That's not looking too bright uh, uh, there. We'll see what happens with him on Friday. Morgan Burnett obviously missed uh, several games at the start of the season. Uh, uh, Bud Dupree, after not practicing on Wednesday, was limited on Thursday. And I think PennLive.com just kind of recapped a story that they have uh, this morning. And Dupree's got a torn right uh, 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 pectoral muscle. And he's supposed to find out Friday morning if he's going to be able to practice practice and ultimately play against the Chargers. So uh, going to be interesting to see what happens with him on Friday. Obviously, if Bud Dupree's not able to play Sunday night against the Chargers, you would think that Anthony Ciccolo would start in his place opposite T.J. Watt. And then, of course, you know, all signs now, and I think Dupree even said as much, that uh, if he's unable to play, he would expect uh, uh, Ola Adenia to be promoted off of IR to the 53-man roster. That would happen Saturday afternoon sometime. And, of course, the Steelers would have to make a corresponding roster move uh, to accommodate him. And, uh, obviously, if a Denier is promoted to the 53-man roster, we would expect him to dress and play uh, against the Chargers with uh, Bud Dupree being inactive. Uh, rounding out the rest of the injury report, Stefan Tewitt is another guy we've had our eye on this week after being limited on Wednesday with an elbow, with that elbow injury that forced him to miss the last two games. He practiced fully on Thursday. All signs are pointing him doing so again on Friday and if he does that means he should make his return to the field uh, on Sunday night against the Chargers. The rest of the guys Xavier Grimble, Vance McDonald Marquise Pouncey, Ben Roethlisberger, Ramon Foster, B.J. Finney, uh, all are expected to practice, I think, fully on Friday and thus hopefully not be uh, on the injury report to close out the week. Uh, Xavier Grimble was dealing with a concussion to start the week, but he's practiced full uh, the last two days. Vance McDonald, who did not practice on Wednesday because of a hip injury, practiced full on, on Thursday and appears to be good to go there. So the big names, I think, were keeping an eye on later on today are Morgan Burnett with the back, Bud Dupree with a pectoral, and I guess Stefan Tuitt with the elbow. Those are the names to watch. As far as the Chargers injury report goes, pretty much status quo and what Eric uh, Williams told us that that folks will hear in the the interview later on. Uh, Melvin Gordon has not practiced this week with that MCL knee injury. He's not expected to play against the Steelers, uh, nor is Brandon Meebane. Not injury related, but having uh, personal issues that he's having to take care of, not expected to play against the Steelers. Uh, Antonio Gates returned to practice for them, practice fully, uh, not injury related. He's going to play Sunday night against the Steelers, as is Austin Eckler, the backup running back, who has practiced fully twice with a neck injury. And the only other name really to watch, uh, uh, you know, might be interesting on Friday, is wide receiver Tyrell Williams uh, with a quad. He's been limited both Wednesday and Thursday. I would think that he's probably going to practice on Friday and be able to play uh, Sunday night, but stranger things have happened. He, of course, is tied with Keenan Allen uh, with 10 explosive play receptions on the season. So definitely a name to uh, to keep an eye on there. Who do you think makes a starter right tackle? And we can safely assume Gilbert's out again. Um, I guess it's no surprise there. So is it Filer or is it a core for? Yeah, I think I think there was a report earlier in the week that that Filer is uh, taking first team reps, so okay. I, I I would expect uh, I would expect it to be Filer. Uh, by the way, you know you had a, you'll probably uh, uh, you're talking to the tape video that you released on it was it yesterday mm-hmm. uh showed uh, a core for uh that was a great breakdown by you showing how how they helped him out in that game look it was odd we knew going into this game that chooks was going to get a lot of help mm-hmm. uh with with von miller and uh he did and it wasn't you know in some cases i don't think it was as obvious but uh, i thought you did a great job of showing how they slid protection to his side uh how you know they weren't they weren't huge uh uh 
chips by McDonald or, or James or whoever was on that side when it happened, but it was just enough to maybe get uh, A to have uh, Von Miller have to line up outside uh, and not you know not get that 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 good of start uh, in the pass rush when when a tight end out on that side and and a few of those chips were just good enough to to knock. Miller off balance a little bit and give Chooks a little bit time time to uh, get into his pass set and then on a few other ones uh, I thought it was good that you pointed out how you know especially when they slid protection to that side that that uh, DeCastro uh, his ability to help and slide protection that way would allow Okafor to protect the edge a little bit more. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't take a lot if you can ship a guy and slow him down by a half second. A half second means an eternity in the NFL as a pass rusher. So that that's all it takes is just sometimes the alignment of the tight end to force a guy with a to, to, to align outside shade and be wider and not let him have an inside kind of two way go where he can rush inside or rush outside. Um, just give the tackle more time to react and and wait for it. Uh, but yeah, you, you can't stop these guys with just one way. They're tight end chips, they're back chips, they're slide protection, they're multiple of those things in some place that we showed. Um, and it would have been the same case whether it was Filer or even probably Marcus Gilbert. Gilbert you probably could have been uh, a, given a little less help to, but um, you're still going to do some things to slow Von Miller down um, that, that they did for a core four. And that'll be the same story this week, Dave, going against two really oh, talented pass rushers. Bosa. And Bosa, Melvin. Mo- yeah. More Bosa probably, but but yeah, Bosa's, I think he had two sacks last week. We'll, we'll save some of this for the Chargers talk, but uh, yeah, that's going to be a similar story because I have the one clip of Arizona triple teaming Bosa last weekend, and uh, it'll probably be a similar story. So so Dave, just real quick, who do you think the inactives are? You're, you're a big guy talking about the inactives. We know yeah, some of the it, usual it, names, but take a crack at it. Yeah, and it's, uh, yo, it's gonna, that's really tough to do on a Friday, not knowing what the transaction or what a potential transaction on Saturday uh, is going to be. I mean, I'm, obvious, ma- I'm making you earn your money. I'm making you earn your yeah, money. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. You know, it just uh, it, it, who's who's going to be the back end of that transaction with the DDA? And that's that's tough to do. I mean, obviously Rudolph's going to be down. You would think Justin Hunter, if he survives, is going to you know uh, survives the transaction is going to be down. Uh, I'll go ahead and. I'll go ahead and guess that Dupree's going to be down. Uh, we'll learn more about that on, on Friday. Gilbert's obviously going to be down. Uh, you would think with, with Tuit back that LT Walton would be down. Uh, how many am I up to there? Banner, of course, will be, be uh, inactive there. I don't know how many. I, I, I forgot to take my shoes off here. Uh, uh, four, I, I, a little bit. I think that's five or six right there because we got uh, Banner, we got uh, Rudolph, we got uh, Walton. Uh, I mean, look, it's just it's, it's, it, you know Dupree. I'm gonna guess that he's gonna be down. So the mm-hmm. question becomes, you know, uh, who, you would think Marcus Allen's gonna be inactive if he survives. So mm-hmm. I, th- I think that might be seven there, which would mean probably I don't know. Brian, I mean, Brian Allen's gonna be the guy on the back end uh, of the Adenia transaction. So. Uh, I'll have a better guess or a better educated guess after Saturday, Saturday at four <laughs> at at four p.m. Eastern because that that's of course when we expect the uh, the Steelers to announce if any uh, transaction to take place. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me make it an easier question. Who do you think if, if a Denier comes up? And I agree, probably is what's going to happen. If Dupree, I doubt it's going to play. And Denier will get the call up. Who who who's the odd man out then? Is it Brian Allen? I would think probably Brian Allen. It would make the most sense, I think, if it's Brian Allen. I mean, because well, Banner. look, I mean, uh, you, huh? Why not Zach Banner? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, the dude hasn't dressed for a game, even though we've had no, he, no, he has, he, he has dressed, dressed for, for like, two two what? games. Okay, but uh, he he hasn't even come close to playing a snap. I don't know. I, I think you dump Banner. I think you yeah. bring him back. Well, I mean, uh, you could get. Do the do the tur- look. I mean, this late in the season with teams out of it, they, you know, uh, Banner's got Banner would wind up on another team easily. I would think. You think? I think he would. Based off I of mean, what? Uh, just based on depth and, and teams already looking ahead. You know, this is a time of year where where practice squads get get sure. uh, uh, get uh, pilfered, and you know, if you got a guy, if you got a depth guy, uh, especially tackle. 
I mean, look, I mean, this is a former, what was he, third or fourth round draft pick? And... Yeah, but that doesn't matter. The dude was sitting on the street till halfway through. Uh, uh, I mean, just... Do you think he has a better chance of getting claimed than like a Brian Allen? I think Allen would have a better chance. I think both Allens, Brian or Marcus, would have a better chance than Zach Banner. I mean, I think all, I think there could be a, a chance, e- any of them. You know? Oh, sure. There's a chance any of them. But, well, but the not now. I mean, look, I mean, you're not going to get a guy claimed on a Sunday. Okay. But, I mean, you could have him turn around and get signed. You know, the, the well, you do the, old, week. you do the old wink wink of we'll bring it back. Yeah, I mean, if, if a guy's going to get a better chance, a better opportunity somewhere else, I, I don't know. I, I'm just telling you the way I, I mean. I, I can see it being Banner. I mean, I I can see your argument for it being Banner. But, mm-hmm. uh, look, I mean, you're not guaranteed to get any of these guys back. Sure. You know? So, but you you can make an argument for it to be Justin Hunter. Yeah, I, I'd be leading that argument. I don't think it's going to happen, but I could right. see it. I mean, I, I, mean, I would we, I'd be we, okay we with could, it. And, look, here's the, here's the other thing. Well, I mean, Morgan Burnett's and I, I didn't add him to my inactive list, but, I mean, that's another guy All that right. – what happens if uh, what happens if he's inactive? You know, mm-hmm. uh, do you have to have Brian Allen uh, maybe to be active? You know, for for that game. So uh, it's going because of the way this injury list is shaping up. They, it's really going to be tough to guess who the odd man out is is going to be on a, on a, a Denier transaction at this point. All right. Yeah, it'll be a more difficult week, but like you said, we'll get some clarity. Probably by the time people listen to this podcast. Is this speaking of Burnett? Is this Burnett's? Is Burnett one and done? I think we've had this conversation before, <laughs> but I think he's going to be thirty-one. The injuries. I think he's missed a quarter of his games the last three years. I, I think you just kind of maybe you know move on after this year. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, 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 you even if you carried him, I mean, you could carry him through. Through the uh, you know uh, invite him to training camp, but I mean, does he make the 53 man roster at that? And what he's scheduled to make? I mean, right. you you have Edmonds who's supposed to take over that role now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would not be shocked if he is a pre. You know, we were talking about uh, the first week of March or the last week of February mm-hmm. that that Burnett ends up being a salary cap casually. I mean, you could easily see that at this point. I mean, it wasn't. It looked it looked decent, like a decent signing at the time, you know. But he just he hasn't been able to stay healthy, and you know he hasn't played. I mean, what 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 have you thought of his play when he's been on the field? I mean, it's been okay. I think there's some stability there as a tackler. I think he's been able to match up against tight ends. I think he's been a good dime guy, um, better than Cam Sutton in, in, in dime packages. But they've basically decided Edmonds is going to be the guy at strong safety the last two weeks. Burnett hasn't rotated in the way that he did a couple of weeks prior to that. Um, and now he's down again. So, uh, yeah, Edmonds is clearly going to be the guy, for better or worse, in 2019, no doubt about that. So at best, Burnett's coming back for that backup dime kind of role. And I think at his salary, at his age, with his injury history and the, everything that's lingered with him, it's not going to get better. You're not going to get healthier as you hit your, your early 30s with all the, the, the back injuries and the hamstring and stuff he's had to deal with. So um, probably a good idea to move on at that point. Yeah, I mean, you got uh, him scheduled to make, I think it's $5 million next season. You're not going to pay a back up that. So. Yeah, and I'm not, ta- I'm not carrying him to camp because he's not one of those. He's not on a salary where I can carry nah, him to camp. No, no, no. So, yeah, it would make sense to make him a salary cap casualty in late February or March. Uh, Marcus Gilbert, you know, four, I think he's uh, scheduled to make uh, almost uh, $5 million uh, next season. I think 4.8 something is his base and another $50,000 uh, workout. So, I mean, between those two guys, that's, that's, that's t- almost $10 million prior to roster, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do we call it? Displacement. displacement. Right, you know, mm-hmm. there with those two guys, so that wouldn't be surprising at all to see those two guys not not be on the roster come come March. I mean, look, you got Filer, you got uh, Chooks. Who know? I mean, we don't know what we have in Gerald Hawkins really yet. You know, I mean, but I mean, he's a guy that 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 uh, uh, you could at least keep around and, and, and take to camp with you to see what you have there. Uh, you obviously have Alejandro Villanueva, so. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a couple of quick decisions to save yourself some, some cap space. Better odds of returning in 2019, Marcus Gilbert or Morgan Burnett? 
Yeah, I'd have to say Gilbert probably the better odds, but not by not by a lot, right? I, I, I would say by a little, uh, but because Gilbert, I think, is the better player, A, and B, if he comes back, he could still have that starting role, which Burnett will not. Would, I, I, I still think it's like 50-50 if Gilbert, excuse me, if Gilbert comes back. I'm not ready to – people saying you know, he's, he's definitely going to be cut. I'm not there yet, but, but it's, it's certainly a possibility. You know, it might be in his best interest to get himself cut, especially if he can come back and play well in, like, the final three games or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, if he if he, if he he suits up and, and plays and plays well and let's say the Steelers go deep into the playoffs, he's going to be in high. He'll, he'll have some demand to him. Uh, and, you know, if he's only scheduled to make, uh, not even five million. He he would be able to get that in uh, at least in probably signing bonus and base money, mm-hmm. uh, uh, signing somewhere else as a as a street free agent. So <laughs> who knows? Maybe he's maybe you know he had said I think before last season that he he you know wanted a new contract. He's not going to get that right now. Well, we know that right. not from the Steelers. So it might be in his best interest for him to to get cut uh in in late february or march yeah maybe he'll have to come back though first and then that does not seem to be close well i guess we'll see what happens uh, any other Steeler thoughts dave here before we get to uh, our buddy eric williams uh what were what, what were we had something we were going to go over there but i, I don't uh, i don't think it's important there you know randy what do you think about all this talk right now about trying to frame these numbers of, you know about run pass and i think the, the the big thing on thursday was oh look how ben's not able to connect the uh, uh, uncatchable passes with with Antonio Brown. I broke that down in the first four or five games of the season, and and uh, you know it's gotten better. You know the whole Wi-Fi and mm-hmm. and and that. Yeah, he, look, I mean he the last couple of games he hasn't been 100 percent on uh, on track with Antonio Brown, but it's been a whole hell of a lot better than it was in those first four or five games, uh, with those two there. It just, it just seems like some of these guys and gals are trying to make mountains out of molehills, if, if, if you will. And there's just nothing there. You know, the whole talk about is Juju the, the, the number one, you know, wide receiver now. I mean, that just, that's ridiculous. Well, I, I don't care what order you put those guys, and I just know A.B. and Juju are supremely talented, and, and they're good for this offense. So, I, I mean, A.B. is still the number one guy in my mind, and I think everyone on that team realizes it, but I don't really care what order you put everybody in. Uh, I, I think the Ben A.B. criticism is more valid than the throw-too-much criticism because this is an offense that ranks, what, six in the NFL in points per game, second-best red zone offense, excellent on third down. I mean, it, the results speak for themselves, I think, if you look at the team as a whole. So do whatever it takes. It's, it's always been my philosophy. And look, they're going they're, they're, they're going to run more if they're more in control of, of some games, you know, which mm-hmm. they haven't been the last two weeks, obviously. I mean, when, now, have they abandoned the run, uh, you know, a little bit early, maybe in, at times in, in the last couple of weeks? I don't know. I mean, when you figure when they got the ball, when or the times of the games, when they possessed the ball, and we already talked the other podcast about you know within the final four minutes of the of of the halves of each of these last two games, they had to throw, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, and then a couple other times I think there were a three and out or a four and out or something like that, and then Ben's throwing. Uh, interceptions, you know, uh, on the first or second play of a drive, and then something along those lines. So, uh, look, I mean, if they if they're able to jump on teams early, then you're going to start seeing the run used a little bit more, and especially later in the game uh, as well too, if they have the lead. I mean, obviously they haven't been able to do that in the last two games late because they've been trailing uh, trailing on the scoreboard there. So, uh, you know, the big thing, and I keep pointing back to this, is I like to see. James Conner get off to better starts in games when when running the football. You know, just more successful runs. I mean, look, you, and we'll talk about this here in a minute on the backside of this interview, but the Chargers are a great team on first down. It would be great to see the Steelers kind of have, even though they're close to that, they're not in the same uh, category, at least statistically, yards per play on, on first down as the Chargers. So we'll talk about that on the backside, but I guess now is a great time to segue to uh, our buddy uh, Eric D. Williams from uh, ESPN. 
All right, welcome back. It is, of course, uh, today is Friday. Normally on Wednesday, we have a beat writer from the opposite, uh, opposite team on uh, to, who, you know, to give us a rundown of what's going to happen in this week's game. Uh, we couldn't get that set up for Wednesday, so we have moved it to the Friday show. And we are pleased to have back on the show again. It's been a long time. In fact, last time he was on the show, he was covering the Seattle Seahawks. He now covers the Los Angeles Chargers for ESPN. I am, of course, talking about Eric Williams. You can follow Eric. Eric on Twitter at Eric underscore D underscore Williams. And you know what to do. Hop on the Twitter machine and let Eric know that you heard him on a terrible podcast and thank him for his time. Eric, welcome back to the terrible podcast. Hey, thanks again for having me guys. I appreciate it. Look forward to talking yeah and look we're looking forward to this being a, a a great game as well too sunday at heinz field uh sunday night in fact the game got flexed there the chargers coming uh coming to town to play the steelers uh eric let, let's start off this way uh i have talked for weeks now that we're not really going to know who the steelers are probably until this game against the Chargers, and then you know, a couple of weeks against the, the Patriots, and then, of course, week 16 against the Saints. When you look mm-hmm. at the Chargers, and you look look at who they've played already this year, and you look at their record, is this sort of the same thing with the Chargers this time? I mean, do they have a signature win so far this season? And on top of that, is this going to be their biggest test of, uh, of the season? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think if you talk to Charger fans and if you talk to people nationally, they've really been looking to this game and then a couple of weeks from now when the Chargers travel to Kansas City, those two games as as measuring sticks of whether this team is for real or not. I don't really think they have a signature game, but I think anytime you go to Seattle and win in Seattle, even though that team is kind of retooling, I think that's a pretty big win in order to get a victory in that environment. And I'll tell you this, I think Cleveland's a lot better than people are giving them credit for. And we're finding that out, that maybe that coaching situation was an issue in terms of, you know, you look at the talent that they have on both sides of football. I think that, you know, that's going to be a tougher game than maybe people are giving credit for in terms of the Chargers winning there and winning pretty handily. Um, But I do think this game, nationally televised, you know, playing the Pittsburgh Steelers on the road, a perennial playoff team, um, will say a lot in terms of, who the charges are, and where they're going to go moving forward. Uh, obviously, being on the West Coast there, the injury report comes out a little bit later. I suppose that uh, I haven't checked in the last hour or so. Uh, I imagine their first injury report for Wednesday is out now. Uh, obviously, Melvin Gordon, uh, their star running back, is is going to miss this game with a with a knee injury mm-hmm. that he suffered last week there. But you know, people see that and they might get a little bit excited. But that, let me tell you that Austin Eckler, he really sticks out on film, and when you look at his 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 stats on top of it. Uh, this is not that big. I mean, it's a it's a step down, obviously, but it's not as big yeah. as what what many people probably think. And this also, I think you even wrote about it recently as well too. This Eckler kid, he's a strong kid, isn't he? And and in answering that, if you'll give us a rundown on the injury report. Sure. Well, let's go to the injury report first. Uh, you mentioned that Melvin Gordon is out. He's not going to play, even though uh, Lid hasn't said it definitively yet. Uh, Antonio Gates also did not practice, but more of a maintenance issue for the 38-year-old tight end. And then Brandon Mebane is dealing with a family matter. Uh, he didn't play last week, and he's not going to play this week. So that's a bit of a blow in terms of their run defense because Brandon, of course, is their main run stuffer inside, played on Seattle Super Bowl team is, is in his net third season now with the Chargers. Uh, Tyrell Williams is limited with quad issue. He's been dealing with that for a couple weeks, but I, I expect that he'll play. Um, in terms of Eckler, I think you saw a similar back if you were a Steelers fan last week in Philip Lindsay and, and with the Broncos. Um, a, a guy that's small but probably plays bigger than his size at, at 5'9", 200 pounds. Lynn said he's pound for pound the strongest player on the team. Um, and I think with, with Austin, it's a couple different things. They line him up a lot of different areas on the field. You know, they'll line him up as a receiver and run him on jet sweeps. He can run in between the tackles. He's strong enough to do that. And he's really elusive when he gets out in the open field, can make people miss pretty consistently. And he has that extra gear where he can run by people. He he ran a 4-4-3 in his pro day. So he has some juice in terms of getting out into the open field. Uh, Behind Austin, they have Justin Jackson, a rookie they drafted in the seventh round out of Northwestern. He ran for 1,000 yards, four straight seasons for the Wildcats. 
Um, pretty good pass catcher of the backfield um, and a, a decent runner in between the tackles. I kind of compare him to, to Mo Morris. If you remember, Morris used to back right. up Sean Alexander with the Seahawks. Right. I think he runs kind of like him. Um, reminds me of him. And then the other guy behind him is, is Detrez uh, Newsom out of Western Carolina. He was an undrafted rookie. He's kind of like more like Eckler. He's 5'11", 210 pounds, a little bigger than Eckler, maybe a little more physical runner than Eckler, and he has some explosiveness too. Um, so I guess the thing about those backups is they're untested, so you don't know how they're going to do if they're thrown in there and they're asked to you know, run the ball 10, 12 times. But I think you're going to see all three of those guys on Sunday. Hey, Eric, just big picture with the Chargers, kind of similar to the Steelers, you know, similar records now. They got off to a one and two start. They've won seven of eight. And the only loss was that uh, last second one to Denver. What changed from those first three weeks to now to kind of hit their stride and get into this real long winning streak? Well, I think the short answer is they weren't playing the Chiefs or the Rams. (laughs) Fair (laughs) enough. Two two, two of the top teams in in the league. Um, So, you know, I don't know. We didn't we didn't know what to expect for the Chiefs, to be honest. I mean, Obviously, they've they've kind of ran the AFC West for the four or five years. That uh, you know the Chargers haven't beat the Chiefs what nine straight games, so they've they've had trouble with that team. But we didn't know what we we're going to see from Mahomes. A lot of people were kind of comparing the, him to Brett Favre. You're kind of going, really, Brett Favre this early? And then you watch him and go, okay, yeah, maybe maybe that's legitimate because yeah. he was making ridiculous throws and and just the playmaking ability. Um, I think kind of caught them off guard a little bit with the Rams. Uh, everybody kind of knew what they were getting there in terms of McVay and innovation. Um, so just playing the top two offenses, I think in the league, um, really kind of made those statistics early on a little bit distorted. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you start one and two and I think people forget about you. You're already the second team in LA anyway. So it's going to be hard to get, uh, headlines nationally. And like you guys said, they, they didn't really play any other, top teams other than those two early in the year. And so I just think they, they, they played against lesser competition. They have a very talented roster. They have one of the best quarterbacks in the league and they, they started playing like up to their capabilities basically from there. We hear a ton about the new head coaches that are taking the league by storm guys like, you know, Sean McVay, Matt Nagy out in Chicago. We don't hear about Anthony Lynn at all. I know he's an older guy than some of those uh, guys that I just named, but, but I, I don't think he probably gets the credit that, that he's due. So what makes him an effective coach and just tell us about Anthony Lynn. Um, I think he's no nonsense and transparent and players like that. Um, and, and he holds them accountable. Um, I also think the fact that he played in the league and won a Super Bowl, that carries some weight in the locker room. Um, mm-hmm. And so guys really respect when he talks and, and they'll listen to him. I think the fact that they went 0-4 last year and he was able to kind of keep things steady and it didn't go off the rails and then they finish off winning 9-12. and um, Again, I think that that helps with the accountability and kind of earning players' trust. And it's kind of carried over uh, to this season in the second season. And I think the other thing is, is, is um, he's holding Phillip Rivers accountable. You know, Phillip Rivers threw a career worst 21 interceptions in 2016, Mike McCoy's final uh, season with the Chargers. In 2017, when Lynn took, took over, one of the first things he said is we can't turn the ball over and basically demanded that Phillip Rivers take better care of the football. And Phillip has done that uh, just 16 interceptions over the last two years. Um, and, be still making explosive plays, but if it's not there, you know, a lot of times in the past, he would try to fit into a tight window and maybe force it, trying to get his team back into it. Now I think he's more willing to dump, dump it down, get the check down, get the ball early and see if they can make a play. And if nothing's there, he'll throw it away or take a sack and, and, and punt because they have a pretty good defense. So he's more willing to trust that the defense will get the ball back for him. Can you have Anthony Lynn call Ben Roethlisberger and tell him not to turn the football? <laughs> hey, I'll, have, I'll have him call Ben after the game. Uh, yeah, have, have him hold him a little bit more accountable there. No, it, <laughs> it, it, in all seriousness, look, I love – I, I Philip Rivers is a fiery guy. Uh, I, I've liked him since day one, although I don't like watching him sometimes because that throwing motion of his no. makes it makes my arm hurt. Uh, uh, and it, all, it makes me feel like I have to throw my shoulder into a, a door jam to, to hey, 
to to get it unseparated. But uh, look, his son throws exactly like. Oh that. lord, oh lord. Uh, well, the the thing is, Mike Tomlin hit on hit on uh, Rivers. You know, talking about him on Tuesday, and he said, uh, "Look, I mean, he's not. You know, one thing you're seeing Philip Rivers do this year is he's getting them in and out of negative plays. You just don't see mm-hmm. the Chargers have the negative plays on first down. And of course, he pointed out their first and ten statistics and all like that. Look, we've we've I've watched Philip Rivers a long time. Alex has. As you have what is so different this year because he really is playing well and and look the, the offensive line Mike Pouncey's Mike Pouncey he's good of course the the uh, the left tackles experience over there well you know as well too but it's not like he has this earth earth shattering offensive line what's different about Philip Rivers well one of the things is the turnovers like I talked about you know he's not turning it over as much he's getting the ball out quick um, he has a lot of playmakers around him. I think the pouncy thing is probably bigger than maybe people are giving it credit for. Yeah, you might um, they right. haven't had stability at, at the center position since Nick Hardwick retired in 2014. They've cycled through a lot of guys. So to have a legit center anchoring that offensive line helps those two young guards. Uh, you said they have a, a, a blindside protector in, in Okum who's solid. Um, and then, you know, Joe Barksdale and Sam Tevye have been rotating right tackle. So up front, they really um, they have good chemistry. And I think that's helping Philip as well, maybe buying him a little bit more time. And he's a little more trusting that they're going to hold up in terms of pass protection. Along with that, I mean, you have to point to Melvin Gort. I mean, he has balance. The last time that Philip Rivers was playing at this type of level was when he had LT and he had a running game. And he didn't have to throw it 45, 50 times a game in order to, to score points and, and be efficient. Now when they run play action, I mean, guys are wide open because you have to suck up because if you don't suck up to get Melvin and let those legs get going, it could be a long day for the defense. So I think probably the the number one key has been their ability to effectively run the football with Melvin. And, And again, I think that makes you a little bit concerned if you're a Charger fan, if they're going to be able to run the ball as effectively with Melvin out. Uh, I don't want to spend too much more time, obviously, on the offense. But Keenan Allen, Mike, yeah, Mike Williams at wide receiver, of course, Tyrell Williams, yeah. a good crew yeah. over there uh, uh, with with that bunch. I mean, uh, and they're healthy, and that's the biggest thing. Keenan Allen's been bothered by injury. I think Mike Williams, of course, ha- uh, last year ha- had some issues as well too. And oh yeah, Travis Benjamin uh, is in a slouch either. When you switch over to the defensive side of the ball, <laughs> this defense has slowly gotten improved on tape as the season has gone on here. And oh yeah. Yeah, they just got Joey Bosa back, who had missed like nine games with a foot injury. He got two sacks in his, uh, I think, his first game back last week against the Cardinals there. Is this just a matter of this defense finally getting healthy? I mean, look, Desmond King is someone Steeler fans had their eye on. Derwin James, the Steelers would love to have Derwin Derwin James, but there was no way they were going to be able to get him where he went. Casey Hayward at at one cornerback position. Uh, Is it, you know, what's happening with this defense? Because, you know, honestly, they weren't, you know, they, they played some, of course, some high-powered offenses right out of shoot, Rams, yep. Chiefs, and all like that. But it really looks like they're coming into their own now. I think one of it is, is health. Uh, certainly, when you're able to get a guy like Bosa back, one of the best pass rushers in the NFL, it's going to help your your defense. I tell you what, Casey Hayward is president of the Joey Bosa fan club because <laughs> hey he doesn't he doesn't have to cover as long just you know and he knows the ball is going to come out so now he can cheat a little bit um so he's he's happy to see joey bosa back on the field i think along with that it's just getting guys comfortable in the system and in their roles and what the expectations are you know this is a bend but but don't break defense this is the seattle cover three you've seen it in jacksonville you've seen right. it in atlanta you're seeing it in san francisco as well so the object is really to make the offense work their way down the field, and you're hoping that they make a mistake at some point. Don't give up explosive plays and then try to take the ball away, keep them out of the end zone, hold them to field goals. And so to, in order to do that, you need a pass rush. You need to have four guys that can get after the quarterback up front. You're going to play a lot of coverage, and then you have to have sure tacklers in the back end. And so getting Derwin James, as you mentioned, was huge because he's kind of Cam Chancellor and Earl Th- Thomas wrapped into one guy. He, um, he's a great blitzer. He's a great tackler. He pursues like a crazy man. Um, but he can also go back there and play deep safety and, and come up and, and just smack people in the mouth. He's got great ball skills. He's got great instincts. I mean, he's probably going to make the Pro Bowl as a rookie. That's how well he's playing right now. 
Um, so he's a game changer. And, and then you add him to Melvin Ingram, Joey Bosa up front in terms of what they can do. Uh, you have a guy like Casey Hayward at cornerback. That, that's a solid player for them and made Pro Bowls in the past. And then in the second level, I think they've gotten better. Of course, they miss you know, Denzel Perryman, who's out for the year now with a leg injury. And they also miss Corey Legit, who's also out, you know, a three-tech uh, defensive tackle that could push the pocket. But really the key has been Jatavis uh, Brown and his development in the system. He's a guy that struggled last year, changing from a 3-4 to a 4-3 system. But now he's their defensive play caller. Um, he's playing with much more anticipation. He's got great speed and range. And their ability to, to play nickel and dime and still stop the run and then be effective in terms of the pass coverage, um, I think has been a big difference. Everything the Steelers try to do, <laughs> but, but but it looks like the Chargers have, le- have been a little bit more effective, especially in the turnover category. Go ahead, Alex. Well, you know, Dave wants to borrow Anthony Lynn. I want to borrow Derwin James because, like you said, that is a guy that the Steelers are already be dying to have right now. But uh, I, I want to talk about the defensive line a little bit. You know, you mentioned uh, M- Mabane's going to be out uh, this week or likely could, yep. could be out this week. So what, what is the Chargers bringing in that defensive line? You have Isaac Rochelle, some other names that probably most fans outside of L.A. aren't super familiar with. So just kind of give us an overview of that defensive sure. line and, and how the run defense might look this week. Yeah, when they go base, they're going to have uh, – Joey has their strong side in. Melvin Ingram will be their Leo or weak side in. And then inside, you'll probably see Darius Phylon as the three tech. And Damian Square is going to play nose. And Damian had been playing base in with Bosa out. He actually dropped about 10, 15 pounds so he could move outside. And so now he's a little lighter playing inside. So I think that's a little bit of a concern. Um, when they go past rush, you'll probably see Uchenna Nuosu, their second round pick out of USC. He'll rotate in along with Isaac Rochelle, as you mentioned, and then Melvin Ingram. And the thing about Ingram is, at times, they'll move Ingram over to the same side as Bosa and run games with those guys. Mm -hmm. And that really just gave the Arizona Cardinals fits. I mean, actually, they cut Andre Smith the following week after what what happened in terms of what they did to him last week um, because they just abused him. Um, So that's that's the thing that they like to do. They like to to get that kind of NASCAR pass uh, package, get four speed rushers in there, and then go to work. I'm a big uh, special teams nerd, Eric, so I love watching touchbacks and field goals and punt coverage. And and I thought was interesting with the Chargers this year is you've had, what, two kickers, two punters. I don't know the whole situation there. Was it injury? Was it poor play? And and kind of how are special teams looking for for the Chargers? Yeah, that's a great question. It was a little bit of both. I mean – uh, they went into training camp with Caleb Sturgis and um, Roberto Guaro competing for the job, but they gave Sturgis pretty good money. I think it was two years, $4.5 million. So he was going to be the guy. But he was also coming off a hip injury. It missed you know, pretty much all of last year with the Eagles. Um, and so they were kind of you know, hoping that he would be healthy. Mm-hmm. And then you know, he just had the hips. You know, he missed, I think, six extra points, missed four field goals. So they had to make a change. Uh, they brought in Michael Badgley, who actually went to training camp with the Indianapolis Colts, an undrafted rookie out of Miami. Um, made all his kicks uh, with the Colts. You know, obviously didn't make that team because Vinatieri's there. Right. Um, they brought him initially because Sturgis was hurt, and he and he made all his kicks the two games that he started. Then they they gave Sturgis one more chance, and it just wasn't happening. So they needed to make a move, and they went with Sturgis, and he's been he's been money. We're calling him the Money Badger. Uh, because his, his, uh, his nickname, I think, is probably going to stick. I think he's missed one extra point, but other than that, he's been solid. The one thing about uh, Badgley, though, is he struggles on touchbacks. I think he's got maybe four touchbacks out of 18 kicks or something. I think it's the worst percentage in the in the NFL, which they're trying to figure out because he can make field goals for 60 yards. So he has a leg, uh, but he's trying to learn the technique in order to be more consistent on touchbacks. But uh, the guys love him. Uh, he's, he's, he's a good guy in the locker room. He's a guy that, you know, wasn't just a kicker. He was a guy that played football uh, mm-hmm. in high school. So, so I think he kind of you know identifies more with the players. Uh, in terms of the punting position, I just think that Drew has a – Drew Kayser, who their, their punter was early in the year, strong leg, um, you know, can kick the you-know-what out of it. <laughs> but um, he wasn't a great directional kicker. And so that was an issue for them. And then he also struggled holding at times, you know, mm. a couple of different kickers that cycled through it had complained about, um, you know, the, the holds 
And so they wanted a veteran guy. They, they went and brought in Donnie Jones. And, uh, you know, Donnie doesn't have the leg that Drew does, but he can directional kick. And a couple different instances where they needed to flip field position at the end of the game, Donnie has came through for them. Um, so I think they're happy with where they sit right now at, at punter and kicker. And then Desmond King has been an improvement in terms of, of kick returns and punt returns, although Travis Benjamin has been returning punts the last couple of weeks. Uh, Eric, before I get a prediction, get you out of here, you, you, you know, look, uh, teams haven't been able to really focus a lot on it because of scores or whatnot with trying to consistently run at the Chargers at times this year. But when ha- when teams have kind of dedicated uh, it to it, it looks like they're able to run uh, to the offensive left, and which would be kind of the right side uh, of the defense there. Is this what the Steelers, I mean, is this the way you, you know, the weakness in that Chargers defense, you know, run some power or run? You know, off left guard and off left tackle because to me that looks like looks like the prime area to try to run at him at. Yeah, I think that's going to be the focus for me is is like you said, run the football when the Chargers are in dime and can they stop you? You know, because a lot of times they put um, Adrian Phillips in there as their Mike backer, and Adrian's you know six foot two hundred pounds, and so you wonder if he can hold up in terms of the run fits uh, being that small. For the most part, he's been pretty successful, but I, I'm sure the Steelers are going to see that. Ben's obviously going to see that. They have a smaller guy in the middle, and, and they're going to test it and see if they can get that going. I think along with that, um, I think Jaleel is a guy that can be tested in terms of the back end because he has given has given up some big plays. So maybe your tight end or slot guys on some seam routes where you can get them matched up with Jaleel and, and see if you can get a big play that way. All right, Eric, uh, this isn't going to air until Friday, but uh, we're going to go ahead and put you kind of on the spot. This line opened up with the Steelers at home, I think, three and a half favorites. I think it's moved down already a little bit to three. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets a little bit closer to kickoff. What's going to happen Sunday night at Heinz Field? Uh, how about how about a little prediction and you know final score prediction there? Yeah, that's, that's basically a pick them, isn't it? With, right, uh, you know, home field advantage. Three points yeah. for home field advantage. Um, yeah, I'm tempted to pick the Chargers. I think this is the kind of game that the Chargers would would come through on because they're kind of the underdogs going into it, and I think people probably don't expect them to win in this environment. Um, but I don't think it's going to be this week. I, I think um, I think the Steelers are probably the more desperate team because of what happened last week in Denver and and, and want to kind of reestablish themselves as as the favorites to win that division and wanting to protect home field. So um, I like the Steelers in a close game, 30-27. Fair enough. And, I, you know, after talking to you for the last 20 minutes, I can remember why we had you on so many years ago uh, with, with uh, covered the Seahawks there because you're excellent at what you do. I think our listeners are really, really going to enjoy you. And, unfortunately, well, who knows, maybe in a couple more uh, you know, couple more weeks uh, we'll, we'll get to maybe talk sure. to, you, to, you, to you again in the playoffs because it looks like both teams are sort of headed that way. So we're going to keep you in the Rolodex for sure. Uh, folks, You make sure you follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric E. R I C underscore D underscore Williams. Reach out to him. Let him know you heard him on the terrible podcast. And Eric, Hey, thanks so much for uh, working around our schedule and doing this in the evening here. And thanks for being on a terrible podcast again. Thank, thanks, Eric. Sure. No problem. Thanks for having me guys. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks again uh, to Eric Williams. Really appreciate it. Great interview. Uh, Dave, I know you'd mentioned in the interview that you talked to him. What year did you talk to him? 2011? Yikes. Uh, It was, yeah, it was the two times, not the last time the Steelers played the Seahawks, but the time before that. So that would have been what? 2011. Is that right? I think so. But yeah, so it's been a while, but it was a great interview and you can see why you had him on before. Yeah, and, and, and folks, you know the drill here, listeners. Uh, please, uh, you know, it, it really means a lot to these guys if you reach out to them uh, on the Twitter machine and thank them for the time. It helps uh, helps uh, helps us make sure we land them the next time we need them as well, too. And who knows, with uh, with Eric, you know, with, with the Chargers and all, we might be talking a second Steelers-Chargers game you know, in, in the playoffs at some point. So uh, you can follow Eric on, on the Twitter machine at Eric underscore D underscore Williams. And that's Eric with a C hop on there and let them know you heard, uh, heard about him on the uh, terrible podcast and thank him for, for, uh, for his time. 
Okay, let's kind of carry the baton where he left off, Dave, and, and talk about this Chargers offense, which has been phenomenal this year. And I don't care that they don't have Melvin Gordon. They're still going to be a huge threat run and pass. But what sticks out to you about this Chargers offense? I think their ability, and Mike Tomlin hit on this the other day, I think their ability to do great jobs on, on first down and stay out of negative plays, whether it's Phillip Rivers, Go, uh, um, uh, you know, directing traffic and getting into an empty set and moving a, a, a running back out of the backfield out wide. Uh, regardless, he has done a great job at, at, at getting them in great situations on first down. And I think when you look at them statistically, uh, Pro Football Reference has them averaging 7.07 yards per play on first down entering week 13, and only the Rams have averaged more per play at 7.28 yards per play. Uh, on first and 10 plays, uh, specifically, the Chargers offense has averaged 7.37 yards per play, and if you drill that down even further, they're averaging 9.47 yards per pass play on first and 10 and 5.79 yards per play on running plays on first and 10. And even in their three losses this year, who, which have come to Denver, the Rams, and Kansas City, uh, they are averaging over uh, right at seven yards on first down uh, in, in those games. And one of the byproducts, of course, of that is, is that when you when when you know when you gain you know stay above the head of the chains on first down you're not you're not going to be in, in in that big of you know uh, problem on third downs and I you know, this bears this out uh, with them as well too they have run only 119 third down plays so far this season only the Kansas City Chiefs have run fewer go imagine uh, mm. h- however when faced with third downs this season. On average, the Chargers have needed uh, a little over seven yards on average on third downs, which is slightly below the NFL average of 7.09 yards. So, uh, and on those third downs, they have converted just 37.8 percent of them, uh, and you know that's that's kind of. That's in the bottom half of the league, and I think I don't know who what, who it was that asked Keith yeah. Butler uh, the question on Thursday, but said, oh, "What do you think about the Chargers being so great on third down?" Well, the fact of the matter is they're not. So, you know, I think a big aspect of this game, and Mike Tyson, look, I mean, this is a tr- thing, this is in rocket science here, and I'm not breaking any news. It's, it's the key to every game: is can they limit the Chargers' offense on first down? to four, you know, three yards or something along those lines and get them into third and six or seven or eight situations where they can tee off on them. You know, I think that's going to be a key because if you keep, if you let Phillip Rivers stay in a situation most of the game where he's facing, where A, he's not either not facing third downs or B, he's facing third and three or third and four situations, stuff where really, your your entire playbook is is open to you. He's gonna he's gonna rip you apart. I mean, there's no two ways about it. This guy that's thrown six interceptions, and I don't know if you've gone back and I'm sure you have at this point gone and looked at all six of his interceptions. Only one of them is was deep down the field, more than 15 yards, and I think that was the one against the Raiders. Uh, the other ones. Uh, you know, or, or, or shorter distance ones. I think one went off the hands of Melvin Gordon in the red zone against the Browns, and then the other one was a, a screen just a few weeks ago sniffed out by Von Miller uh, that he picked off. So the odds of you, you know, you you the only way you're gonna to me to pick Philip Rivers off in this game or to sack Philip Rivers is to get him in a third and long situation. If you're not able to do this, it's going to make a long day for this defense. And yes, I know Melvin Gordon is going to miss this game, but let me tell you that that uh, that Eckler kid is not a uh, you know. Yes, it's a downgrade, but it's not as big as anybody. I look. I would love to have Eckler backing up James Conner. <laughs> Conner, after looking at him on on tape, and he kind of reminds you a little bit of a McCaffrey, kind of a, a Philip Lindsay uh, kind of player because he can do it all and catch the ball out of the backfield as well too. Yeah, he's kind of like everything that you would want Jalen Samuels to be. You know, that hybrid receiver, runner, bigger guy at 
five eleven, two hundred pounds, uh, but sh- short, shorter guy, but 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 you know, kind of a, a well built player. But I agree with everything that you said there. Um, they, they, it's a weird stat on third down because they are so good on on first down, but they're twenty second in the league in third down percentage. But that's because, like you said, they just simply don't get into third down in those situations. They get seven yards on first down, they're converting on second down, and they just don't put themselves in the third and long. Uh, generally speaking, so it's a weird stat there. The other stat that stuck out to me is just how well they take care of the football. They're, I think, uh, plus four in the turnover ratio. They're, I think, have the third fewest giveaways this year. Rivers only six picks. A running back has not fumbled the football once this year. And we know the Steelers' big bugaboo on defense is forcing turnovers, and this is a bad matchup because the Chargers have better ball security than maybe any other team in, in, the, in the NFL. And uh, where are they in red? I forgot to look at uh, red zone with, with them. 15th uh, so overall, so average. Yeah, so they're average inside the red zone. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, though, they 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 can possess the football and they can move the football. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if they're in second in, I mean, if they're in second in four or five, it's going to make for a long day. I mean, and then you know, like I said, if they get into third and in short situations, it's going to make for a long day. It's just it's hard to imagine what with what we've seen. Out of this Steelers defense to date, now obviously getting to it back, especially if he's healthy, would be a big shot in the arm for this defense. But this is a defense that might be without Bud Dupree. Some people might shrug their shoulders, you know, <laughs> with that and say, "Okay, big deal." You know, get in. You know, maybe a Denier gets a, a few snaps in there. But I mean, let, let's face it: even if a Denier play, you know, uh, is activated, dresses, and plays, how many snaps is he going to get? Ten. Well, he'll get whatever Chicolo gets typically, which is about fifteen a game, probably. Yeah, ten, ten to fifteen. I mean, is he, can 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 a Denier be a difference maker in this game? I mean. I don't think he can, quite honestly, not where I'm sitting right now. Uh, put it to you this way, I, I think the Steelers' defense is going to have their hands full, and they're really going to have to prove something to me. Now let's flip it on the other side. I know you've already wrote about this uh, 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 this morning. You know, What are we looking at here with the Steelers' offense going up against uh, the Chargers' defense? I mean, to me on tape, this looks like not only a team that you can run against, especially to uh, the Steelers' left side, but you know, I, I think you can attack them vertically. Well, real quick, I just want to flip to the to the Chargers' offense for two seconds because I want I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about their receivers: Tyrell, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, the most one of the most technical route runners in football, and, and they're just a team that runs these levels concepts and they use the middle of the field really effectively. So if I'm Keith Butler, I'm running a lot of cover one, run a lot of cover one robber where I have a, a, a guy lurking to take away those crossers and a single eye safety to take away the posts and and stuff like that. But yeah, Joe Hayden versus Keenan Allen is going to be a big big time matchup, and, and Hayden's got to bounce back after. The worst game of his Steelers career against Manny Sanders last week, but but with the Chargers, and like, well, like I said too about Tyrell Williams, if he dresses and plays, I mean, and Mike Will, Mike Mike yeah. uh, uh, isn't a slouch too, but uh, Tyrell has I think already ten receptions of 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 twenty yards or more, as does Keenan Allen. So those you know. They they can get you in a lot. You know, you talk about running the levels, and of course they have Antonio Gates, and they're going to try to do some things with Eckler out of the back. I mean, they're, he's Philip Rivers has a lot of great targets to to spread the football around to, uh, and I expect him to do that. You know, yep. Sunday night against the Steelers. Absolutely. So so with the Chargers defense, yeah, I think you know you can establish a run game because it was an average run game to begin with, and without Mobane, their big nose tackle in the middle makes them a team that you can run on a little bit better. They will go into some kind of small nickel packages where I think, as Eric talked about, they bring in Adrian Phillips, a safety to replace uh, one of the linebackers, and so they'll go with kind of that subset, um, and you can run on them a little bit in those situations because they'll do it on early downs against the 11 personnel against three receiver sets. So, um, it, again, it's, it's a good group. It's a good group, uh, secondary. I love Derwin James. Uh, he was so much fun to watch when I did my tape study. Des King's got three picks this year. Um, they can be aggressive in terms of their secondary blitzes. Usually it's one guy that does it. Des King had, I think, three sacks last year, four sacks last year. Derwin James leads all defensive backs with three and a half sacks this year. But but for me, like I said, th- when you when you when you break the huddle, you get the line of scrimmage, you got to find 33. That's Derwin James. He's going to line up everywhere. You have to identify him. He's going to screw with your protections and both run and pass. Um, but he is a game breaker for him. They've gotten better defensively the last couple games, I you know, I thought. 
well, not playing the Chiefs and the Rams to start, I guess, probably helps those numbers. But, but they, yeah, they have. Uh, but, but again, that would bang. I think, I think you can't establish a ground game. What do you think about my question to Eric about the, you know, there's, I mean, are the Chargers, <laughs> are the Chargers might be the AFC West version of the Steelers entering this game. I mean, do we, and, 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 and might be all, of, you know, all of the, the version of the Houston Texans in the uh, South. I mean, do we really know who these teams are right now? I, well, I think they're a good team. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I, right, I I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're not a good team, but just how good are they? I don't know. I think they're pretty good. I think, I mean, they've had it. Yeah. They, 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 they had a rough schedule to begin with. They were tested it early and I think they're better because of it now. All right. Uh, how, well, how do you don't, you don't think, what do you, what do you gauge? No, no. At? I mean, I, I think they're a good team as well too, but I mean, I don't think that, you know, I, I think their signature win to date is the one maybe against the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. And this will be a good litmus test for both teams, absolutely. Right, and I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at. I mean, this is going to be uh, this is going to be a good test for both these teams, especially for them, for, for the Chargers too, because they're having to go on the road to do it. Mm-hmm. And the way things are setting up right now, they're going to have to play on the road during the playoffs as well. Right. Yeah, L.A., a very much single high coverage team because they have Derwin James in the box so much. They're going to run a ton of cover three. They probably run more cover three than any team, maybe Seattle. Uh, in, in football, Seattle, I think, is down on their cover three usage this year. So they will match, and they will defend against four verticals, which is a big uh, vulnerability to, to cover three. But if you're if you're Pittsburgh, you're trying to attack them deep. Attack a, a day, a, the, the free safety there. He's not the best safety in the world. So if I'm Pittsburgh, try to establish some interior run game. Um, and, and get vertical because I think you can match, beat them with their cover three scheme. Is this just going to be one of the old-fashioned up and down the fields? Maybe. It could turn that way. Uh, but, you know, they could turn the other way too in terms of the favor uh, of the Chargers defense because they have a good pass rush. I think that defense line is active. I think it's a, it's not a, a well-known group across the board. Some of their backup guys, like Isaac Rochelle, was four and a half sacks this year for Rochelle. He had four and a half in his career at Notre Dame. So hats off to him. You get Joey Bosa. He's probably going to play a full complement of snaps this week after being eased in the past two weeks. you got Melvin Ingram. They give you a lot of different looks. I'm worried the Chargers defense can a get pressure and and then b create some chaos in the secondary. Right, and you can't. I mean, you've got to stay out of third and long situations with them for sure. Yeah, I mean I that's mean, true of any team really. Right, but but, but but I mean with both and Ingram, I mean you don't want those guys, and they got some athleticism, you know, at linebacker as well too. So uh, it's going to be a look. We'll we'll get into the back end our prediction here and and some final thoughts on that game. But uh, let's get to our let's move along and get to our picks here as well mm-hmm. too, Alex. Uh, uh, sure, watching football is fun, just like Thursday night was. Uh, but it's more entertaining when you have some action on the games. Uh, I, I, Thursday night doesn't go by that I don't have a little bit of action on the games. Guys and girls, you've heard me talking uh, for several weeks about about some, and some of you are still on the sidelines here when it comes to my bookie. Whether you're an expert or a rookie, you should be betting at mybookie.ag. If you're the kind of guy or girl that likes to bet a little and win a lot, like playing the numbers on the roulette table, you can create a big parlay. You can pick three teams to win, and if you hit all three against the, the number, you turn $100 into $600. It's just that easy. There's so much to bet on. College basketball heating up. College football starting to wind down into bowl season here. NBA and NHL underway now. Custom props. Uh, even esports. You name it. Alex, are you going to uh, that associated uh, uh, alliance football? You going, uh, you going to be interested in watching some of that during the spring? I think I got drafted in that quarterback draft. <laughs> I think they took me in the eighth round. <laughs> uh, it was it was kind of humorous to pay attention to that uh, on, on Twitter. Look, I mean, we're going to be, uh, you know, we'll be breaking down the draft and, and obviously things going on, what we normally do. But I, I there's no way that I'm not going to turn on one of those games a couple of times, I don't think, during the, uh, uh, during the spring there. And I, I would imagine we'll be able to bet on those too, maybe at, uh, at, at, at my best bookie but uh, my bookie is the one bet we know that you'll be happy with all year long i recommend these guys because i really trust them and i use them my bookie has been in business for years they've got great online reviews and their mobile site is very very easy to use sign up this week and my bookie will give you a 50 percent deposit bonus to jump start your own bankroll it's a great way to bank even more money when you win also make sure that you follow my bookie on twitter at bet 
my bookie. They personally respond to every mention and direct message that they get, not to mention that they've given away more than $10,000 in free money to followers this football season. You'll be the first to know as soon as new odds and props get posted by following them on Twitter at BetMyBookie. Don't miss out on one of the best weeks to bet on sports this year. Log on to MyBookie right now and use promo code TERRIBLE. TERRIBLE. Like my speech. Terrible, and to get 50% deposit bonus. That's promo code TERRIBLE. You play, you win, you get paid. And I got paid last night. I had the uh, uh, the Cowboys plus eight, and I think you had the Saints minus yep. eight. Uh, so I'm one up you on your right there. Let's get into some games here uh, this week. Alex, uh, anyone that you in particular looking forward to? I mean, there's a... Uh, Good few good ones on on the docket this week. Colts and Jaguars isn't one of those. Yeah. Uh, the Colts traveling to Jacksonville. The Jaguars uh, plus five and a half at home. Jaguars are plus five. Plus five and a half Ooh. at home. Give me the Colts. I don't care the Jaguars are at home. They got Blake Bortles. Well, I think Cody Kessler's starting this week, but regardless, give me the Colts. Yeah, I'm with you. Give me the Colts on the road, lay the five and a half there. Uh, Carolina uh, goes on the road to Tampa Bay, a divisional matchup there. Carolina, boy, a lot of road favorites. Uh, Carolina favored by four over the Buccaneers. Wow, to be that big of a favorite on the road. But I'm, I'm with it. Uh, it's the same thing. I don't care that Tampa Bay is at home. I think Carolina's, I think Carolina's due to bounce back. I know it's being a little cliche, but they're a better team than the last couple weeks. So I'm going to go Carolina by a touchdown. I'm going to go with you on that one as well, too. So uh, me and you back to back on the uh, on, on the road favorites here to start things off. Uh, interesting game, especially if uh, uh, if you're a Steelers fan, uh, Baltimore Ravens. It looks like Lamar Jackson is going to make his third consecutive start. They go on the road against uh, and play Atlanta Falcons team that Lord knows what's going on there. I mean, uh, you know, still an offense that, you, that looks good on paper, a defense not so much. The Baltimore Ravens are going in there, Alex, and they are getting a point and a half. Uh, Falcons well, favored at home by a point and a half. I'm going to go Atlanta on this one. I think they're getting Deion Jones back. It's going to be big for that defense that's been ailing all year, mostly because of the injuries, not because they're just a, a team lacking talent. And, and yeah, I, I think that they can slow down Baltimore enough. So go, give me Atlanta. Yeah, but how many times, I mean, uh, Lamar, it's going to be interesting with Lamar Jackson, uh, you know, can he run right now? I mean, did he did he pull a hamstring or whatnot? It's going to be interesting to see uh, I, Falcons at home with, against a, a rookie quarterback. I like my chances there. I think the Falcons win this by a field goal, so give me the Falcons laying a point and a half. Here's a good one for you. Cleveland Browns on the road against the Texans. We've talked a little bit recently about who are the Texans at this point. Well, you know, the Browns aren't playing bad football right now in Mayfield and that defense. Greg Williams doing a great job there. Even so, the Texans at home are favored by five and a half. Give me the Browns. Houston's going to win. Give me the Browns to cover. Um, and, and I think I think the biggest reason why I say that is because that Texans O line really scares me because you got Miles Garrett against <laughs> the Texans O line. They've not done a good job protecting Deshaun Watson. So that's the big difference for me. Give me the Browns to cover. I think the Browns can win this outright. This might be a money. I might, I might make a money line play on this one. Uh, so with that, uh, yeah, I'll take the Browns plus the five and a half points here. Uh, real yawner. I don't think we'll be tuning into this one. Buffalo Bills go on the road, play the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins are three and a half point favorites. The Bills have surprised a few people the last few weeks. Yeah, give me Buffalo. Uh, just because they have a really strong defense that no one talks about, unfortunately, because their offense is just among the worst in football. I got a buddy that's a, a big Bills fan, and I just feel so bad for him because it's just nothing to talk about each week. But I'll go Buffalo here, I guess, to cover. I'll take the Dolphins at home, lay the three and a half. Uh, I think they win this by a touchdown. Uh, Bears go on the road. I think Mitch Trubisky not going to start this. Or I think Chase Daniel going to get another start here, uh, possibly for this game. Bears on the road against the Giants. Even so, the Giants uh, are the underdog, of course, uh, getting four points at home against the Bears. This one's tough because the Giants have played better. They blew that lead against the Eagles last week. Mm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Chicago because that defense is so aggressive, and, and the Giants have still been so mistake prone. So a little bit of debate, but I'm going with with the Bears. Yeah, this is a weird game for sure. Mm. Uh, you know what? 
I, I think the fighting, fighting Eli's can some can surprise some folks here. I'm, I'm going to put this in a parlay, three-team parlay also. So give me the Giants plus four. Uh, even if they lose, I think they can keep this maybe maybe to a field goal. Uh, Den- Denver on the road against the fighting Driscolls. Uh, the, the Cincinnati uh-huh. Driscolls. Boy, what uh, <laughs> if Cincinnati if Cincinnati drops this one? I mean, it, it's gonna get. Yeah, we talked about how it could get ugly with Cincinnati. It has, and it might get worse here. Uh, Denver's not a bad football team. Uh, if they're able to run, who you know, they they might be able to run the Bengals right out of their own place again. I, I imagine that uh, attendance uh, won't be hmm. he- heavy there at Paul Brown Stadium. Denver favored by five on the road against the Bengals. What you got? Hugh Jackson, 2019. I am dying for that headline in Cincinnati because I will laugh forever. Uh, give me Denver because uh, by by double digits, I'll say because I don't know how those. Bengals linebackers are going to try to cover Philip Lindsay. Good luck. Denver's going to win big. Yeah, I think Denver wins this. Probably not as big as you, as you, uh, but uh, I'll take Denver lay the five points on the road against uh, Cincinnati. The Rams go on the road against the Lions. Big number here. Uh, Rams favored by ten and a half on the road. Ooh, that is a big number. Um, give me the Rams still though, just because I think Detroit. Detroit's been a weird team. It just hasn't clicked for them in the, in the Matthew Stafford era, which is unfortunate because he's a heck of a quarterback. But but give me give me the Rams in this one. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm a, give me the Rams to cut. That's a big number though. I, yeah. I'd like to. See I'm that gritting thing. my teeth as I pick the Rams here. I think I'd like to see that dip maybe by another half point by kickoff. But uh, give me the Rams later ten and a half. Arizona Cardinals on the road against the Green Bay Packers. Boy, I got uh, Aaron Rodgers going in a couple of fantasy uh, fantasy uh, championship round uh, games this week and need him to come up big the Packers who is Mike McCarthy done after this year is yes. that it and he sh- yes and he should be to be honest with you and, and, he, sh- and he should be is Mike McCarthy gonna be the next head coach of the Browns God, he, I hope he, for their sake not he he gonna surf for somewhere right I guess but I, I would I like Harbaugh's odds of resurfacing quicker and a better team than, than McCarthy who who's going to be without head coaches? What what about uh, you think uh, uh, McCarthy in Cincinnati? No way he'd work for uh, for for, uh, for 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 them, would he? I don't know. I, I guess mm, it's possible. He's used to working for you know Green Bay was not a, a thrifty team, so I guess they would kind of mesh. I don't know. Maybe. What about ba- what about possibility of Baltimore with with McCarthy? But I'm I'm with you. I think McCarthy's probably going to be looking for a job uh, fairly soon. And they are playing the Cardinals at home. The Packers are favored at home by 14, two touchdowns. Oof! Give me the Cardinals to cover. They got a good defense. They'll keep that score low. I'm going to be- take Arizona to cover. Because I'm rooting for Philip uh, or Aaron Rodgers uh, real hard in this one. Give me the <laughs> get, give me the Packers minus 14 uh, in this one. Kansas City. Well, you want to talk about another big number on the road against the Raiders? Chiefs lane 15 and a half. It's gotta be one of the biggest lines of the year, probably, huh? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a divisional game. Those things always get to be a little bit tighter. I'm gonna be stupid here. I'm gonna go Oakland to cover, but the Chiefs are certainly gonna win. Yeah, Chiefs win. I, I give me the Chiefs to cover this one uh, on the road. Uh, the New York Jets at the Tennessee Titans. Uh, the Titans favored at home by nine. Is Sam Darnold gonna be back this week or no? I honestly haven't looked. I don't know if it's going to be him or McCown. Um, but I'm going to go Tennessee on this one just because I think the Jets are just basically looking to next year at this point. Titans, boy, they, they can't afford to lose this one. Uh, whether yep. or not they cover that nine, we'll see. I'll take the Titans at home covering that nine. Minute, you know, This is the game that's outside of the Steelers and Chargers. This is the game to watch. The Vikings on the road against the Patriots. The Patriots favored by five and a half at home. Is that too much? Yeah. Not for me. Give me New England. Uh, but it'll be good because that, that Vikings defense is so underrated. The third down, they're amazing. They're first and third down defense. They're first and red zone defense. It's some really impressive numbers. So it'll be interesting. But I'm going to go New England by, by touchdown. The Vikings do one another one of those teams that do a great job at disguising what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, because they got a good safety play. You got Harrison Smith. You got a good safety play you can disguise. 
I think the Vikings. I think the Vikings can stay close with this, if not win. So give me, give me the Vikings on the road plus the five and a half. Uh, that is the Sunday afternoon game. As is the 49ers at the Seahawks. Seahawks at home, favored by ten and a half. A lot of big numbers this week, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, give me Seattle. Nick Mullins uh, had his moment in the first start. It's all kind of been downhill since. So give me Seattle. All right, and I'll take Seattle laying the ten and a half as well. That leads us to Washington on the road against the Eagles. Weird number here as well, too. Eagles favored by six at home. Give me the Eagles. They, they, I think they're gonna kind of ride off the high of that comeback last week. You got Colt McCoy starting for Alex Smith. Yeah, I'm not. I don't love this game, but I'm gonna go Philadelphia. All right, uh, I'll take Washington on the road plus the six. I think Philadelphia might win, but I think the Redskins keep it close. That, of course, brings us to the Steelers Sunday night hosting the Chargers. The Steelers, I think, started off three-and-a-half-point favorites. They're now down to three-point favorites. What's going to happen? This one's tough. I just I look at this Chargers team. They're really good, I think, in, in all areas. I think because of how well they take care of the football, the defense that can create some turnovers and get some pressure. I know their sack numbers don't look fantastic, but that's without Joey Bosa for, for all, most of the season. I'm going to go, and this is by a good omen, if you know me and my track record. I'm going to go with the Chargers in this one, Dave, 28-21. Uh, I'm worried about this game as well, too. I, I've talked all along about how these, these games against the Chargers, the Patriots, and the Saints are going to be. Look, I think this I think this defense needs to show me. I mean, can't if they can't hold the Chargers under 24, I don't like their chances of winning. Uh, I, I really don't. If they can hold them under 24, yeah, I, I like their chance. I'm not convinced. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to pick against them as well, too. I have the Chargers 27, the Steelers 25 in this one. I, I, wow. I just said, uh, you know, so uh, uh, what 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 is the narrative if the Steelers, let's say, you know, not only win, but beat them kind of kind of convincingly and by convincingly, I, I'm talking about more than a touchdown. I mean, what what does this what would that mean? I, I would assume that it means they force some turnovers. And, and if you're going to beat a good team like the Chargers by you know multiple scores, then that's probably how you did it. And, and that would be an encouraging thought for this defense. I think the defense has played well. I think they've done a lot of impressive things. I think they've come a long way since the beginning of the year. But like I said, the biggest issue I have with them, and that's been consistent throughout this whole process, is lack of playmakers, lack of splash. And it's not going to be any easier against a really good Chargers team that does not turn the football over. The only way they beat them is if they have two turnovers, right? If they force two turnovers, that, do do you think they can beat the Chargers? Uh, either, either uh, well, definitely not uh, losing the turnover battle. You would be shocked if the Steelers win this game if they lose the turnover battle, no matter what the number, right? Yeah. Bottom line, I think they need to force at least a turnover and be even in the turnover margin to win this game. Right. I'm with you there, and I'm not sure they can do that. I mean, uh, yeah. how many times? How many times do you think they're going to get to Rivers twice? I mean, they've done a good job getting pressure, and the, and the Chargers O-line isn't great. Um, yeah, two, three times, you know, because they're going to throw a lot, so that, that would make sense. Do you think we're going to be in another situation next week where why 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 aren't the Steelers running the ball more? I don't know. I, I, I don't care about that stuff. People talk about that. I just want to move the football effectively. I, I think you can establish a ground game. If they can't be an effective run team, that'll be disappointing, but I don't totally care about the number too much. I just want to be effective when you do it. Will James Washington have a reception over 30 yards? <laughs> You're asking me that now? No. Um, no. no I, will he get 30 snaps? No. I think he gets 10, 10, 10 to 15 snaps. Yeah, I think uh, I think he's going to get out snapped quite a bit by uh, by Ryan Switzer once again. All right, well, that's where we stand on this. Uh, Alex and I both don't think the Steelers will be able to win this one. Hopefully they prove us wrong. Hopefully we're talking about a big, uh, big Steelers win on Monday. And regardless of what happens, we're going to be breaking down uh, the game. We got anything else to cover, Alex? Nope, just send your hate mail for our picks today, Brian. <laughs> that had been at Steelers Depot, not to me. Uh, right. Uh, f- uh, follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. You can follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. You can, of course, follow the show at Terrible Podcast. You can email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do on SteelersDepot.com and want an ad free version of the site, you can go there and click on ad free upper right navigational bar. And for $25 for a calendar year, get an ad free version. 
uh, of the site and make it easier on you to read if you, if you uh, have any of those issues. And, uh, Alex, I look forward to get after it uh, with you on Monday morning. Hopefully we're talking about a win. And as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex. 